Hello friends, so welcome to Empty Cloud Monastery. I am Aya Soma and I'm here with uh, Bhante Sudaso. And uh, we're both here at Empty Cloud uh, with also another special guest, Bikuni, that we're trying to get <laughs> also to you to see. But um, I think we'll be successful in 24 hours. So you can um, tune in another extra reason to tune in tomorrow at 7 30 p.m for our monk chat and we'll have a third special guest <laughs> hopefully if everything goes well and you know uh, that will be happening but for now it will be Bhante Sudazo and myself discussing the Sadha Sutta but before that I'll invite Bhante Sudazo to guide us in meditation practice yep. so you can start by getting in an upright sitting position So taking a, a few seconds to carefully adjust your body, making sure you're sitting in a stable <coughs> position. And once you're settled into position, make a determination to let the body remain still for the whole period of meditation. Keeping the body still is easy. Just don't move it and it will be still. So make a determination to not move the body during the period of meditation. Relax. Particularly relaxing your face, all the muscles around your eyes, in your jaw and bring a slight smile to your lips. And take a couple of long, slow, deep breaths. Putting down all of your worries, putting down all of your plans. For the next few minutes, there's nothing you need to think about, nothing you need to remember, nothing you need to plan. You just focus entirely on being completely content and happy with this moment. So content with stillness, content with alertness. So bring all your attention to the present moment clearly feeling your body motionless and serene. And let the mind settle in the body, letting the mind become just as motionless and peaceful as the body. Keeping the mind alert by paying close attention to the body, close attention to all the sensations appearing and disappearing every moment. But without moving the mind, without chasing after any experience, just letting the mind sit still in the body, 
just as the body sits still.
mind off some meditation. And thank you, friends, for joining us this evening. Hello to Gita, Mary, Kumo, Jayanta, Marielle, Melissa, Julie, John, Patricia, Saul, Shadow Label. <laughs> so as you guys are so still, I thought the video was frozen. Great. <laughs> Rupali, welcome. And Sood, good to see you. Hello, Kevin. Lots of good friends. And good to see you as well, Gita. <laughs> All right, wonderful. So this evening, as mentioned, we will be reading from the Sata Sutta, Gutra um, Nikaya 5.38. And I'll put the Pali here for you, Bumpet. And there will be Kubali's translation over here. And before we begin, we can start by paying homage to our original teacher, Shakyamuni Buddha, the reason why we're all gathered here this evening. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma Sambuddhasa <laughs> And at any time, you're welcome to put any comments you like in the chat. Um, but the sutta begins. Because these five benefits come to a clansman endowed with faith. What five? One, when the good persons in the world show compassion, they first show compassion to the person with faith, not so to the person without faith. When they approach anyone, they first approach the person with faith, not so the person without faith. When they receive alms, they first receive alms from the person with faith, not so from the person without faith. When they teach the Dhamma, they first teach the Dhamma to the person with faith, not so to the person without faith. With the breakup of the body after death, a person with faith is reborn in a good destination, in a heavenly world. These are the five benefits that come to a clansman who has faith. Would you like to share some words on sadha, actually? That is no, the other word on faith. You go first. Oh, I invited you first. So. <laughs> um, yeah, so the word sadha, well, it's commonly translated as faith or sometimes as confidence. And uh, the most basic definition of faith in a Buddhist context is faith in the awakening of the Buddha. This is sometimes called Tathagata Bodhisattva. So faith that the Buddha was awakened. Um, and in many ways, this is the critical foundational um, faith that one needs to have in order to really sincerely practice Buddhism. Um, if you believe that the Buddha was fully awakened, uh, then you'll be more inclined to have confidence in the Dhamma, to trust the Dhamma. Uh, you'll be more inclined to believe that the Dhamma has value and it's worth practicing. By contrast, if you don't believe that the Buddha was fully awakened, if you don't even believe there is such a thing as, as full awakening, um, then you might be very skeptical about the Dhamma uh, and you'll be constantly second guessing the Buddha. Uh, constantly going on your own opinions and your own preferences and your own urges and impulses. So confidence in the awakening of the Buddha then gives one a, a powerful impetus to practice. Uh, if one believes that the Buddha was fully awakened and that the Dhamma is the teachings of a fully awakened being, then when one hears the Dhamma, one will pay very close attention, uh, really deeply consider how to apply it to one's life, uh, deeply consider its 
its usefulness and value. Um, and if one lacks faith uh, that the Buddha was awakened, then it's important to see what you can do to develop that. Uh, one of the main ways of doing so is, is reading the suttas. And so through reading the suttas and deeply contemplating them, it starts to become clear that this was the work of a fully awakened being. Uh, this was not the product of um, delusional people. Uh, similarly, through practicing the instructions of the Buddha, one starts to come to a deep confidence in their value through direct experience. Uh, and that also helps to build up one's faith in, in the Buddha, uh, in the Dhamma and in the Buddha by extension. Um, so those are just a few introductory remarks. Would you like to add anything to that? Thank you, Bhante. Um, yeah, actually what comes to mind is also the um, um, qualities that are sort of the kind of aftermath of one one has faith and how it manifests um, in terms of things that uh, in the beauty of the qualities of mind um, that then lead us also to surround ourselves with uh, essentially good Kalyanamita friends. Um, so you know, um, here over and over again, it says, you know, talks about kind of like the, um, the magnetism that faith has uh, towards good people. Mm -hmm. So good people that we want to have in our life uh, that will help us um, along the path, will inspire us um, in the path. So what I find very interesting is actually a reflection both for um monastics and lay people um, that are based in, in faith, you know, uh, obviously in the traditional Buddhist countries, there is uh, quite an emphasis on um, um, revering, you know, uh, the triple gem, the Buddha, the Dhamma and the Sangha, uh, this constant devotional practices uh, that then create a mind of faith. And it's so beautiful actually to be surrounded. We have such a great honor to be surrounded by so many uh, people so, from so many different um, uh, Buddhist countries um, here at Empty Cloud who uh, come and support the Sangha. And it's, it's just remarkable to be around with, around um, those qualities of mind. They are in fact a magnet, uh, you know, I'm probably not uh, the, um a good the good person of the world that the sutta is really referring to <laughs> uh, getting there but not uh, i mean working on getting on getting there but i'm not clearly uh, fully enlightened yet <laughs> um but but yeah you know i see it in my mind i'm like oh it's so lovely to be i'm attracted to that to that which is good that that um, which is in, inspiring to my practice as well. And also as a monastic, obviously, um, you know, part of our training, we take these, uh, it's actually created out of compassion for the Buddha to have, um, you know, a period of um, Nisaya, so a period of dependence on um, senior monastics uh, or monastics who are uh, more senior than us, not necessarily senior full stop. Uh, that usually we tend to think, you know, okay, it's just those couple of years when once I ordain, I take dependence. But in reality, you actually see that it's um, ongoing uh, in the in the monastics who really practice well, where there is always this reverence and deference um, um, towards uh, the yeah, towards the sangha, obviously towards the Buddha, the Dhamma, and towards the sangha, which means also the other spiritual. Um, practitioners. And this creates, you know, it's built in the system so that I think, um, this is my understanding anyway of the Dhamma, it's built in so that then we actually um, start, uh, you know, kind of gravitating towards um, people who are enlightened or um, very accomplished practitioners who will actually not mind having us around. <laughs> And in the best case scenario, actually would like to have us around because um, we also have that, you, you know, that quality of faith in the mind that radiates. So, you know, the uh, different um, senior Ajans, the senior Bantes, the senior Ayas, the senior, uh, all senior, also without the titles, <laughs> but developed practitioners then will, um, yeah, will not mind having us around, but rather if, you know, if we instead are, um, rude, we are, 
uh, grumpy, we don't care, we treat everybody, you know, kind of like, yeah, whatever, get your help yourself <laughs> type of thing, make yourself mm, comfortable and I'll see you never. <laughs> then we also won't create the conditions for us to learn the Dhamma from them. Um, actually, in the Thai forest tradition, when we were traveling in Thailand, um, uh, usually in in the monasteries you'll see the crew Bajan, so a very senior Ajahn. He will have a lot of different monastic disciples doing all sorts of things, actually spending time massaging their feet, massaging, um, yeah, like taking care of any of the of the needs of the Ajahn. And you know, at the very beginning, if one is very unenlightened and foreign to the culture, might think, wow, this Kru Bajan really is helpless, you know, like he can't do anything by himself <laughs> and needs all these servants. But then you, once you spend some time observing, um, you start thinking, actually, this Kru Bajan is full of compassion. Um, full of compassion because he's actually creating all these opportunities for so many different um, monastics to um, interact with him in a way that otherwise... You know, you they wouldn't. They wouldn't have the opportunity to spend uh, time asking questions or just even seeing how an enlightened being um, or you know an accomplished being um, just lives around in the world. So, uh, also when Ajahn Pasando gave us the honor to spend some time at Empty Cloud, we were all like trying to make him comfortable and um, uh, providing you know things for him so that his stay here. Uh, was going to be comfortable and probably you know he would have if he had to go be selfish he probably would have preferred you know to just get his own tea and like be by himself in <laughs> in his room but instead um yeah he allowed us all to um yeah to make offerings to be to be around and in that way then we were able to to spend some time and see how incredibly stable his mind for example is um throughout the day for so many hours in advance you know um sometimes we can get uh, very excited about things and like you know here there is a uh one of uh, my favorite bikunis visiting here at empty clouds so i keep chatting and i am like very excited and my mind is so drained right so like sometimes i'm <laughs> i'm high sometimes i'm low but um yeah so now I also have a sense of, oh, well, actually, I remember Ajahn Pasan, he would spend so many hours talking to so many different beings, or um, Bhante Gunaratana as well, like at Pravana Society, he's so generous with his time, spent hours and hours and hours and hours and hours, Ajahn Brahm as well, hours and hours and hours with, uh, with anyone, monastics, <laughs> like people talking and never being drained. So you see, oh, this is... This is how it manifests, you know, that equanimity, those um, qualities of mind. Anyway, so this is kind of like going on a stream of consciousness. So I'll pass it on to Bhante if he has um, any other thoughts. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, and again, reflecting on the value of being around well-developed um, senior monastics. Uh, again, the Sutta here is emphasizing that uh, well-developed senior monastics, they like to be around people who have faith. Uh, they're not so interested in being around people who, who lack faith. Um, and they like to mm, teach Dhamma to people who have faith. They're not so interested in teaching Dhamma to people who don't have faith. Um, and this is something that uh, personally I can really relate to. Uh, so if I'm, if I'm talking about Dhamma and I can tell that the person who's listening doesn't actually believe a word I'm saying and they're not particularly interested in anything I'm saying, well, then I'm not going to be very inspired to, to continue teaching. Uh, in fact, I, I might be more inclined to, to cut it short and do something more productive with my time. So uh, that's actually something to consider. It's, it's something to consider. How can we nurture this quality of faith within ourselves? Because the stronger we nurture our faith and the more visible that faith is to others, then the more we'll draw good people to us. Uh, and the more we draw good people to us, then the more opportunities we'll have to learn the Dhamma uh, from them, uh, whether verbally through the form of Dhamma talks and Dhamma discussions, uh, or non-verbally, as Ayasama was saying, just through watching the example uh, of how well-developed people uh, live their lives. 
And another point I'd like to emphasize about faith is that faith also manifests through action. Uh, someone who has deep faith in the Dhamma will naturally tend to act in accordance with Dhamma. Uh, and uh, deep faith in the Dhamma also tends to mean that someone will have a very strong conscience. So their hiri otapa, their, their tendency to recognize when a decision would be unwholesome and to pull back from making bad choices. So this quality of, of conscience, of hiri otapa, they'll be very well developed. Uh, whereas someone who lacks faith in the Dhamma, uh, well, they tend to have a much more worldly, secular mindset. The, the whole, it doesn't count if I don't get caught kind of mindset. It's like, well, nobody saw me do it, so it didn't really happen. Like, you know, this, this kind of mind. But if you have faith in the Dhamma, then you know that you never get away with anything. Uh, because whatever you do, it's right inside your own mind. Uh, there's no escaping it. Uh, there's always one person who sees everything you do, and that's the most important person, and that's you. Uh, so if you have faith in the Dhamma, then you'll know that every choice you make is extremely important. And you need to be very careful what you do. So naturally, this leads to this deep respect for morality. Uh, this de deep respect for the value of compassion uh, and harmlessness in all of one's behaviors. Um, and also a, a deep respect for samadhi. Uh, deep respect for cultivating a, a focused and stable mind uh, and a deep respect for wisdom, for the value of, of cultivating a, a deep understanding of the characteristics of, of reality. Uh, so these are things which arise naturally from faith. So from faith, one naturally practices sila, samadhi, and panya. Thank you, Bhante. Yes, another thing that comes to mind is actually um, in relation to uh, when, for example, it says when they receive alms, they first receive alms from the person with faith, not so from the person without faith. And um, I feel like it actually gives us a glimpse on also the, um, the purpose of some of the um, monastic precepts. Uh, so, for example, here, the receiving alms, you know, uh, usually if someone is a convert, both Buddhist or actually before they're a convert Buddhist, <laughs> where when they might be a um, criticizer <laughs> Buddhist, <laughs> criticizing the monastic sangha, uh, they might think, you know, actually that's the alms, you know, uh, that is the first benefit of the monastics. You know, they don't have to work and they don't have to do <laughs> much and they actually get fed. Uh, but here instead we see how it's actually mm, uh, like put as a benefit for uh, a householder, um, mm. the the actual app practice of of giving food to to the sangha, and um, so it's interesting because once again, uh, sometimes we can relate also as monastics to the precepts as these sort of um, constrictions that we kind of like have to do, you know, sometimes sort of self torment or sometimes just not really terribly practical so that we are kind of like well you know i already don't have that much craving in for food so it doesn't matter if like you know i kind of like shop and cook and grow my own food and it's probably like healthier for me anyway to begin with <laughs> and you can go in these kind of like mindsets uh, mind states but um instead one of the main reasons why we do that practice yes it is of course a practice of renunciation but also actually to uh, become a field of merit for lay people um, so to create these conditions for mm, lay people to, yeah, to give to the give to the sangha and be able to listen to the good dhamma, um, and so every single monastic by uh, holding the vinaya actually keeps on creating these great opportunities um, for lay people, and lay people by giving uh, receive these incredible benefits uh, right as it says here and obviously that's a, a product of faith of really understanding fully uh, the value the benefit the good um uh how also this is dhamma right um, that leads to the cessation of suffering it's not just um going on meditation retreats it's not just um you know learning all the suttas by heart but rather uh, really practicing in other ways as well, which are actually embedded, really embedded in traditional Asian Buddhism. There is not even like 
a form, <laughs> sort of formal talk about it. It's um, clearly understood um, and quite inspiring. And obviously, how this, um, you know, the the all of these benefits, uh, four of them actually happen in this life, and then the fifth one um, also after after this life is over, then one inevitably goes to a good destination. And why is that? You know, it's it's clearly like a, a natural consequence of doing uh, good deeds, making all this good merit, this punya, credible punya, that then naturally uh, generates. Um, you know, better better consequences um, once again in this lifetime, but also in future lives. Do you want um, to read the rest of the sutta? Sure. Or do you want to read it, Panka? Could do. So then the, the Buddha concludes the sutta with making a simile and then giving a short poem. So the Buddha says, just as at a crossroads on level ground, a great banyan tree becomes the resort for birds all around. So the clansman endowed with faith becomes the resort for many people, for bhikkhus, bhikkhunis, male lay followers, and female lay followers. And then the Buddha gives a poem. He says, a large tree with a mighty trunk, branches, leaves, and fruit, firm roots and bearing fruit is a support for many birds. Having flown across the sky, the birds resort to this delightful base. Those in need of shade partake of its shade. Those needing fruit enjoy its fruit. Just so, when a person is virtuous, endowed with faith, of humble manner, compliant, gentle, welcoming, and soft, those in the world who are fields of merit, devoid of lust and hatred, devoid of delusion and taintless, resort to such a person. They teach him the Dhamma that dispels all suffering, having understood which, the taintless one here attains Nibbana. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Yeah, so the Buddha is making a, a simile here. And um, you might have seen this if, you, um, if you've seen like a big uh, fruit tree. Uh, when there's not many other trees around, then all the birds will gather around that one tree, uh, enjoying that, that one tree. Um, so the Buddha is saying in the same way, if somebody has very strong faith uh, and good virtue, uh, then all the good people in the world will tend to come and flock around them. Um, so all of the, the well-developed uh, bhikkhus and bhikkhunis and uh, lay Buddhists as well, they want to be around that kind of person. Um, and, and again, here he's pointing out, uh, since they're around that person, and that person gets to learn the Dhamma uh, from such well-developed practitioners uh, and can attain awakening themselves. Uh, so just a, a lovely little uh, simile to round out the discourse. Okay, what is the um, Pali of resort? The, it's Patisarana, mm -hmm. uh, which is related to the word uh, Sarana, which means refuge, mm -hmm. um, but literally it means running back to. So it's what you always run back to, what you're always returning to. Wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> I also love how it's, uh, yeah, once again, um, a resort for, for running back to, for, um, yeah, both the monastic Sangha and for the lay followers as well, for the lay people. Mm -hmm. Um, so how this practice ultimately benefits yourself and others as well, um, very much interconnected. So let's see if there are some comments here. And yes, there oh, are. Yeah, a few. <laughs> and Kevin says, my faith has increased tremendously watching others such as you, Bhante and Aya. Oh, you're so very kind. Uh, growing conduct, character and serenity in the face of aversion. Sometimes I'm the last one to see that my faith is blossoming, but it is. How can I deepen this faith? Is it important for me to recognize my faith? How can I serve empty clouds to deepen my capacity of faith? Oh, nicely. Do you want to answer that? You can answer it. Huh? Okay. Uh, well, first off, it's really lovely that you've noticed that by watching the progress of others that your faith increases. Um, so this is an important quality, which is to recognize the transformative power of the Dhamma. Um, and often it's easier to see in other people than it is in ourselves. 
so you see somebody who they're kind of like grumpy and irritable all the time. And, and then after doing metta for a while, for a few months or years, uh, then they become much sweeter and softer and kinder. And then you're like, oh, this practice actually works. It actually brings tangible benefits. Uh, and you can actually see the same thing in yourself. Uh, sometimes it's a bit more difficult. Um, but looking at yourself, you can also notice how, as you practice the Dhamma with sincerity, that you get discernible results as well, that your mind starts transforming over time. So this builds up, uh, builds up faith within yourself. And as you recognize the increase of your own faith, then that will bring up joy. Uh, which also can actually further deepen one's own faith. So you ask, how can you deepen your faith? Well, actually, it's through paying attention to what you've been paying attention to, which is how the Dhamma transforms people, uh, how it makes people into better people. Um, also, as I mentioned, reading the suttas helps tremendously. Um, discussing and contemplating the Dhamma, so discussing the Dhamma with, with well-seasoned practitioners, that can help a lot as well. But ultimately, it's through practicing the Dhamma and observing its transformative power. Uh, that's what tends to bring the, the deepest results. Um, as for asking how you can serve Empty Cloud, uh, send us an email. Uh, <laughs> the fact that you want to serve is, is already a really good sign. Yeah. yeah, I will only just add to, I mean, everything that Pante said is great. Um, and I would just, I always encourage people to go to, um, yeah, traditional Asian Buddhist uh, monasteries, if they have or temples, if they have um, the opportunity to do so. Uh, because actually being surrounded by a majority of people who are born um, Buddhist really kind of, you know, creates it's dependent origination, right? <laughs> you put the conditions um, in, you surround yourself with conditions that naturally result in uh, in faith result in i mean either you leave you're like okay i can't take this anymore or you're like oh this is pretty great i was the latter i was like oh this is pretty great there's something to it um and it's very natural and spontaneous too so you know uh people that come from buddhist countries are just very joyful whenever they are um, practicing danam uh, whenever they're practicing sinam and that naturally also yeah creates conditions of faith in the mind to arise to also want to partake in this you're like yeah give me some of that you know um in terms of give me some of that joy give me some of that happiness um i do want to you know big things you know like the first time i went to i remember the surrounding temple i didn't cook anything but then the second second time i was like I'm gonna bring something too. And Pate Sugata remembers I would come with this giant <laughs> melanzana and parmigiana, parmi, I don't know, eggplant parmesan. Eggplant parmesan. <laughs> yeah, I remember. Yeah, I would yeah. wake up at 4 a.m. to make it. <laughs> Uh, but it was joyful, you know, it wasn't like, oh, I have to wake up at 4 a.m. Like, really, can these monks, like, have a worse time on what to eat, you know? Like, we can get very practical. <laughs> like, I wish I could give them dinner. <laughs> but it was, no, I was like, yeah, I'll wake up at 4 a.m. and make this. And then I'm going to make them this other Italian dish. And, and uh, yeah, just, it's fun. And, um, yeah, and you're other with other friends. And... It's not even a competition of like who gives more, but it's like an encouragement to give more. And it's, it's, it's beautiful. It really delights the mind. And um, yeah, so I would recommend that. And I know that you're in Manhattan. So I mean, if you're still there, everything is impermanent. Um, we're a little bit further away, but there are other monasteries and temples in Queens and um, in Staten Island as well, both the Sri Lankan monasteries. Um, Thai temple and uh, uh, Cambodian and Burmese also in Brooklyn. So you have many options. <laughs> and Sud says, so Venerable, if one has faith and if one practices and keeps precepts, is it fair to say one likely would avoid the three lower planes of existence? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, because you won't be generating any karma that would lead you to the lower planes. And you'll only be generating karma that leads to the human realm or to the higher planes. 
uh, yeah, so, um, and you might have some, some bad karma lingering from past lives, um, but for the most part, you'll only be generating good karma. So yeah, you'll avoid the lower planes. That's true. And Mary says, I was inspired in faith today, seeing all the food Dana placed outside the monastery. Hope you have all enough for the winter storm coming. Aw. <laughs> Sadhu. Yes, we are always inspired um, by the, um, the lily people that, that come here. They're very mm. incredibly kind, incredibly well developed in, uh, in Dana and Sila. And Pia says, how do you define a faith follower? The Sutta talks about one who has faith and confidence in the impermanence of I consciousness is impermanent, your consciousness, etc. So we think I 23, 25.3. What does it really mean in practice? So a faith follower is usually defined as somebody who has such strong faith in the Buddha and the Dhamma that they will inevitably become a stream enterer at some point. Um, and uh, it's, faith followers are not really defined in much more detail than that. Um, but again, the point is that if your faith in, in the triple gem is sufficiently strong, then that means that you're bound to practice well. Uh, you may, in the beginning, you may not have very good samadhi or you may not have much wisdom, but your faith is strong enough that it will propel you to develop those qualities. So a faith follower, uh, it's usually contrasted to a Dhamma follower. So a Dhamma follower is someone who uh, maybe they don't have much faith in the beginning, but they're very interested in the Dhamma and they become very enthusiastic about the Dhamma. And through investigating the Dhamma, then faith arises. Whereas the faith follower comes at it the other way. They start with this, this deep faith uh, that the Buddha was awakened and that the Dhamma leads to awakening. And based upon that faith, then they practice and they develop a deeper understanding. Um, so they both wind up at the same point, which is stream entry. Uh, but it's whether the, the beginning is through, uh, through deep faith in the Buddha uh, or whether it's through uh, a deep interest in the Dhamma. Yeah, and also, um, I mean, the biggest benefit that I see immediately from a faith follower, for example, when they're practicing meditation is that the hindrance of skeptical doubt, for example, mm -hmm. is not there at all. And that is a major, major, major obstacle for uh, so many people, um, you know, kind of after a while going, ah, I don't know, is this really worth it? Or did I even like understand this properly or like, I don't know, maybe there are some other things in, in the world that are great or, you know, right now, actually, there are so many different spiritual, spirituality, TM, you know, trademarked. <laughs> so <laughs> there's this and this other thing and this other thing again and this other thing again. And, you know, practicing the Dhamma, if we can, if we get into, yeah, if we come without faith can be like this very painful difficult thing to do so then we can start exploring all spirituality tm1 spirituality tm2 spirituality tm3 spirituality tm4 and we're like oh, actually this is kind of like more pleasant <laughs> and uh and then we're like oh yeah they all bring to the end of suffering how about that <laughs> how about i do the spirituality tm number four which um allows me to <laughs> to dance and uh, <laughs> uh, do a bunch of entertainment and do this and that, you know, so it can, it can just easily get distracted and, um, and remove it all together. But instead, if you have that faith, then there's no, there's no questioning. And obviously also the faith creates um, all those you know, conditions to practice dana, to practice, um, yeah, happiness, essentially. You know, the Buddha says, do not be afraid of merit. Um, mm. Merit only leads to happiness. So, yeah, you know, people that come here are always so happy. <laughs> and a happy mind gets easily concentrated, the Buddha says. So mm. that those are all in really evident marks of lay followers that... You know, if someone instead has another entry point, um, I mean, it's all also feasible, but it's those can be a little bit more difficult, perhaps. 
And Melissa says, do people bring you alms every day or do you cook sometimes? Do the same people bring food consistently or is it here or there? <laughs> I love your, uh, you're very practical. Well, if we're going on alms round, we hope uh, we go out so nobody comes. <laughs> Uh, so during the winter, usually here in West Orange, New Jersey, we um, don't go on alms round because there's not really anyone outside in the street. There's, um, I mean, aside from non-human beings, <laughs> there's deer and <laughs> and rabbits, etc. cetera. Uh, but it's uh, pretty cold and a lot of snow right now. So we don't really go Pinda Pada uh, these days. So yes, usually um, people come to the monastery to offer food uh, otherwise there are sometimes uh, lay guests that um, if they feel so inclined <laughs> to feed the sangha they will uh, cook for the sangha and offer the food and do the same people bring food consistently or is it here or there um, we have actually sometimes um, some people lovely people that come here and consistently that they delight in uh, giving food but actually we have so many people from all over the world actually sending um dana which is really lovely and beautiful and very heart uh heartwarming so uh yeah usually they contact our dana coordinator events and uh and arrange for for food to to happen to materialize so so far for two years at empty cloud monastery we haven't had one day without food which is quite remarkable so we can really anumada now right to all the the donors who have selflessly come to uh, to feed us so just it's such a miracle of generosity so yeah every day we're like hmm, i don't know might <laughs> well, either either we will be fat or we won't but it was the same you know in in italy for example when we went um a few months ago Pant and i were in november we were um, around where I come from, Italy, so throughout the peninsula, and people are not Buddhist, and they were not expecting us on the streets. Yeah, we were. There was not one day, right, that we went without food. Yeah, every day we we were always given more than enough. Yeah, or sometimes just enough. Sometimes not quite enough. But you practice contentment, and there is always something. So it's, uh, yeah, rejoicing in in people's good good hearts and goodness <laughs> and Ayurveda says uh, por favor vengan San Jerónimo in Colombia well we would love to <laughs> send us an email uh, we when invited if if all the arrangements are made for us then uh, we'll come if we can uh, so thank you for your kind invitation <laughs> Yeah, we can't. We don't handle money, so we can't just like um, hop on the, on the plane and do whatever we want. But if um, we're invited and it's feasible, then we're always happy to to go. And Marielle, good to see you, Marielle, good friend. Uh, hope all is good in Santo Domingo. And uh, Marianne says, talking about delusion, I just realized today a lot of dust I had over my eyes. It's such a long process that of taking responsibility about what one perceives and not being delusional about reality. Yeah, one thing that helps tremendously is uh, having conversations with other devout Buddhists. Uh, so if we just rely on our own opinions and viewpoints, then yeah, well, it's very difficult to see through one's own delusion. But it's through spending time with other Buddhists and through discussing the Dhamma with other Buddhists that one can start to get a clearer sense of where one's one's views are mm, blurry or distorted. Uh, so it's it's not easy to do it by yourself. It really really helps uh, to have discussions with other practitioners. And Pierre says the translation faith might sometimes imply blind faith. Is conviction a better term? I mean, I think the the better term is always sadha, uh, but obviously there is uh, not the exact equivalent in um, either English or Italian or whichever language we're speaking. And I would say that faith um, captures the meaning of sadha um, pretty well. 
um, it's just that we probably don't like it at first if we are not <laughs> maybe we're raised you know with the sort of judeo-christian uh religions or you know just uh other faith-based religions and um you know we kind of maybe we're triggered right there's this what? faith ah triggered <laughs> <laughs> it reminds me of like you know my religion of birth that I don't like etc cetera, etc cetera. so yeah of course there is the quality of conviction and there's the quality of um, confidence uh, that definitely is has been my experience in the Buddhist teachings but now it's turning more and more into faith and yeah actually blind faith you know like <laughs> I have to say I'm, it's just yeah I'm like just really trusting the Buddha like it's just really you know, there's no evidence up till now, because um, I went through all my skeptical doubt hindrances <laughs> over and over again, and then going like, yeah, I'm not sure about that, and then I was wrong. But now I'm, I just stopped fighting. I'm kind of like, yeah, blind faith in this. Now, this doesn't mean blind faith, lazy faith. Uh, it means blind faith, yes, this is a matter of urgency. Like, so blind faith, sata that like, really propels you um, towards effort, towards actually, mm, yeah, doing what needs to be done in order to remove suffering. And um, yeah, that's wonderful. So yeah, blind faith by all means, big fat. <laughs> <laughs> and Sud says, do you know where a lot of Buddhists are around? I sometimes feel like Buddhists are so hard to come by, especially in USA. Yes, we need to make more Buddhists. <laughs> but also go to Buddhist temples. Um, as far as I know, every single major city in the United States has usually several Buddhist temples um, of various traditions. So if you want to find Buddhists, go to Buddhist temples. Um, so I, I wouldn't actually say that Buddhists are hard to come by. It just depends on where you're looking. Uh, if you're looking in nightclubs, then yeah, you probably won't <laughs> find a whole... You might You might find one just by random chance but you won't find very many but if you go to a buddhist temple you're probably going to find several possibly many buddhists i would say that the best uh, actually um, opportunity that we have currently in the united states is the sri lankan viharas because mm. usually um sri lankan monks speak english or at least there's mm. at least one monk that speaks english <laughs> <laughs> in the temple but most of them yes from my experience speak english and there are uh, the strength community is great because they have immigrated throughout the u.s so <laughs> they have established places in uh yeah as Monte was saying almost like every single state there is um Avihara. Uh, definitely the main cities so here in new york we have three but in places like milan mm -hmm. for example more than three three more than three, more than three in yeah. new york mm -hmm. I'm sure. Which one are the other one? New York City. Not oh, specifically New York. York City? Yeah, New York City I'm talking about. Yeah, the state of New York, then there are more. Oh, yeah. But um, New York City, three. Milan, the city, which is significantly smaller. I'm very proud of this. Five. <laughs> so, so, yeah, it's quite remarkable um, that there are all these places of practice. It's just that usually they're not advertised. For some reason... Um, the most advertised are the is the ah dhamma. <laughs> the dhamma is um, yeah significantly less advertised, which why which is why uh, as a layperson um, I started this organization with Dante Sudasso, and at the very beginning we were quite you know out and about as a layperson. I used to advertise a lot. Uh, I mean not advertise to the level of the Adama, but at least <laughs> tell people that we were there. Then I put the ropes on and <laughs> I stopped advertising. <laughs> it comes with the robes. Um, but yeah, so we need to put a little bit more effort perhaps than, um, you know, just opening a magazine and reading the, the publicity there that is there. Um, but it's, um, it's possible. And Kumo says, maybe conf may the confidence Maybe confidence in the Buddha's teachings can also be used for faith. Yeah, I have uh, confidence as a translation of satta. That's pretty common. Ah, as a translation. Um, okay. I mean, it's not bad. It's not bad. Uh, but I, 
I, I do think that faith is, is probably the most accurate translation rather than confidence or conviction or something like that. And those are okay, but I think faith is a little more precise. But that's just my opinion. Different translators have different opinions. Somebody else says they're hard to find here in Santo Domingo. Yes, it's sometimes it's difficult to to find the Dhamma, which is you know the reason why um, so many different people in the past uh, have rolled up their sleeves and um, organized um, yeah Dharma centers and Dharma places. So yeah, the best thing is to connect with like-minded people while well, keep on practicing and then if the conditions arise then trying to connect to as many like-minded people and try to start anything you know even like um it doesn't have to be a massive organization or a small organization like ours or anything like that even just uh you know different friends coming together and listening to uh, Dhamma talk on YouTube and then discussing it together or reading the suttas uh, together and discussing them and then going on trips to monasteries together. Uh, that's also what some friends were doing in Italy. Uh, they live in a place where there is no um, no Buddhist temple around um, and this um, yeah, really wonderful layperson started a, a center where they, you know, actually like just a small little thing where, you know, him and his friends um, gather. And then every so often they try to go once a month or once every two months, whenever it's feasible, they go to the, uh, a large monastery that is like five hour drive from where they live. And Janaki says, uh, I think confidence is more applicable than faith. Confidence is built on hard proof facts, unlike faith, which could be blind. Yeah, I would say absolutely. And actually, you had asked me like last, well, even a few months ago, I would have probably said I was a big fan of confidence. But now I'm actually like really endorsing the, embracing the faith. <laughs> so um, more because, um, because of understanding of also how we use these words. And sometimes, um, you know, once again, faith, we tend to think of it within judeo-christian context but really there i mean it's blind faith in a god creator so that is mainly what there is in uh, at least that's my experience being born in uh, in a buddhist country it's not just blind faith in in everything but it's blind faith in a god creator um that it's based on what um being born in um yeah, you know, being born, at least for me, in a country where that was said that that was true. But other than that, there was no evidence. So, yes, for the person who will convert, I would say that uh, definitely for me, you know, it's not that I encountered the Buddhist teachings and I was like, yes, blind faith. <laughs> there was a gradual practice. Um, but now, you know, it comes to a point. Yes, I think that confidence is the first stage maybe of faith. I'm sorry, the first stage of sadha, and then it kind of turns into something else that is significantly stronger than just um, just confidence, you know? You have confidence in the map of the subway. You have confidence that, um, I don't know, that, I don't know what we have confidence in right now. <laughs> I'm blacking out, but there, we, we can have confidence in, like, in very, like, um, ordinary things and I feel like the Dhamma is extraordinary so it, it's, it's a little bit more than just um, just confidence in uh, <laughs> in it. What are your thoughts Dante? Yeah I think you nailed it down pretty well. Yeah. Oh okay wow I have those. Yeah. Okay, so that's a stamp of approval. <laughs> Quite remarkable. And Sada says isn't Sada isn't blind Sorry, and Janaki says, uh, Sada is in blind. One has to analyze, put to test before accepting. Yes, absolutely. Piaz says, two types of faith have been described in the Buddhist teachings. Blind, irrational, baseless or rootless faith, Amulika Sada, and confidence based on reason and experience. Does it, is it cited in a sutta? Not that I'm aware of. No, that's probably something from the Apocrypha. Um, I don't think it's mentioned in the sutta anywhere. 
Yeah, I mean, there's also, I think, historical reasons why there's also all these differentiations, because obviously, you know, there's um, there's different ways through which we can relate to faith. Essentially, I would um, I would see what does what is the result of one sadha, and if it leads to action, if it leads to following the noble eightfold path, then it's great. If it leads to, you know, just doing empty ceremony, empty ritual and just thinking, okay, well, I have faith in this and I'm going to be liberated. Well, then that's not very useful. Um, so ultimately, we always have to see how is it in relation to um, the cessation of suffering? How is it in related to the cessation of great hatred and delusion in our mind? And then we can evaluate whether it's it's good or not. Otherwise, we can just get into semantics, you know, blind faith, uh, um, myopic faith, uh, <laughs> stigmatism faith, how do you say stigmatism? Stigmatism. Yeah. Stigmatism, you know, <laughs> like short-sighted faith. <laughs> like you can get very like technical about this thing. And Kevin says, I believe I have a deep faith in the Buddha's enlightenment. However, I don't always act like it. <laughs> Words of wisdom on aligning the two. Yeah, so I'll refer to something Ajahn Chah reportedly said. Uh, he said, most of the practice is knowing what you should be doing and not being able to do it. Uh, in other words, don't worry about it. Uh, just keep practicing to the extent that you're able. Uh, and you'll find that gradually, the areas where you know you should be doing better, gradually you'll start getting better in those areas. Um, but don't expect instant perfection. Buddhism doesn't work that way. Uh, it's a long, slow, gradual process of self-improvement. Um, but don't expect quick results because it doesn't usually work that way. Who not says, well, first of all, lovely seeing you, Nat, online. Um, she's saying, to me, it's like having trust. Yeah. I like that word. Now I am going to use that. Yes. I have blind trust. <laughs> I have carefully reasoned trust. <laughs> and um, Ashel, I think your question is better for tomorrow evening's monk chat. So that's not on the topic that we're talking about today, but during monk chat tomorrow evening at this time, you can ask any question you want, including that one. Mm -hmm. And we'll have our cool bikuni answer it. <laughs> And Maya says, it's, it's very interesting for me because through Buddhism, I was able to see in a more compassionate way Catholicism and overcome many of the judgments I grew up with. Very good. Very good. Yeah. Great. Yeah. It's important to see the good in other people and to see the good in the practices that they do, um, but also to have wisdom. So also be willing to see when a system has negative traits um, and um, you can praise the good traits, but also be careful that you don't praise the negative traits. But yeah, I had a similar experience, actually, after uh, a troubled relationship <laughs> with Catholicism, then actually through Buddhism, um, I started understanding a few things better. Um, but then, you know, there was the acknowledgement also that they are two different systems that actually have start with, a, you know, from a different um, um, working hypothesis to begin with, you know. Uh, so since in Buddhism, we don't have a God creator, then, the, yeah, it's a little bit different, the approach and the goal is also different. Um, so sometimes there is some overlap and sometimes there are some differences. And one needs to, I think, in a spiritual life, kind of decide what their goal is, essentially. Mm -hmm. And um, if the cessation of suffering, you know, is your goal, which is definitely mine, then um, you embrace that. And it's good to kind of understand that that is the, that the Buddhist system uh, leads to that. And if we start, you know, if there's a risk sometimes that we can start doing collages that can get us a little bit confused. <laughs> and Janaki is saying at the same time tomorrow. Yes, correct. Same time, same place. 7.30 p.m. New York City time. We will be three monastics. 
and Aranta says, for me, Sadda has been a process because I realized that my life is better and faith has increased a lot. Exactly. Yes, a process and trust. I like these two words tonight. <laughs> give me more. Give me more. How about you, Tineri? How are you exp experiencing <laughs> uh, Sadda, faith? Um, I think it's great. Um, I guess. <laughs> Um, our resident, sorry, I will repeat, our, son, uh, our uh, resident Inori, who was born Buddhist, has said, I think Sada is great, which is quotable, <laughs> just as it is. <laughs> yeah, I mean, um, it's definitely recognizable when you do wholesome deep, but there's happiness that forms versus, like, when there's unwholesome deeds. Um, actions or even thoughts we need um so yeah happy shatta for everyone and being aware and like mindful being mindful of that is um really important also so to keep on progressing in that and to not forget um those results sad 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 maybe Bhante, you can um give a little summary for the people who <laughs> might have not heard. Um, Sada is great. <laughs> <laughs> and yes? Well, I just had a, a question related so much to that. I get, well, Sada is great. <laughs> but you, mentioned, you talked about it being sometimes the path being it, it is a long process sometimes and thinking it was sudden in my own practice and i was wondering if you guys could speak on that how sada can be a refuge sometimes and we can turn to that in those times where it does seem the practice or progress may seem like it's getting slow or we're not making progress how do we turn back to our faith and that confidence to keep moving forward i mean first off um, second sorry can you rephrase the question for the people online Dante. can you do it it will take me a long time because english i know um, self <laughs> so he's he's asking how to uh, bolster one's enthusiasm for the practice when it seems like one's pro progress is slowing down um so how to use sadda as a way to reinvigorate one's practice is that correct yeah i think and how sadda can be a refuge in our practice mm. It's from the sutta, it's sada is it describes how other people how it becomes a refuge for other people, other people come to us. We're first in alms, um, and in teaching people teach us, but how do we in our own practice, how do we turn to that sada as a refuge within ourselves? I think? Yeah, I mean, uh, as you mentioned, sometimes it seems like our, our practice is progressing more slowly than we would like. Uh, so in that case, yeah, coming back to faith that the Buddha was enlightened and that the Dhamma leads invariably towards enlightenment. Mm -hmm. So this is important because, yeah, sometimes it seems like the path is very long. Uh, and every now and then we it seems like we get uh, on these plateaus where it seems like we're not really making progress, like we seem to remember having made progress. So just coming back to that faith, like the Buddha was fully awakened. The Dhamma leads inevitably towards awakening. So as long as I keep practicing the Dhamma, then I'll get there eventually. Mm. Uh, and it doesn't matter how long it takes. The important thing is that we keep going in the right direction. Uh, so coming back to that, um, yeah, that reminder that it actually doesn't matter how fast or slow our progress is. What matters is that we're going in the right direction. Um, and as long as we keep making an effort to, to practice the Dhamma, then we will keep going in the right direction. Okay. Yeah, I would just add, um, what really helps me is um, really looking at causality. Um, so there are some things that can be counterintuitive, once again, with um, um, both Dhamma and Vinaya sometimes, mm -hmm. right? It's just it's just part of being unenlightened that some things are a little bit off or they're not or maybe we just don't want to do it you know 
<laughs> we were kind of lazy and we're like, ah, yeah, I don't know, this is a little bit annoying and I'm, I, I don't want to um, quite do it. Um, but when you start observing yourself in others, at least this is what works for me, is uh, you start connecting the dots of how certain practices create certain results and then how, um, yeah, it's, there's this sense of inevitability, inevitability, is that a, an English word? Um, yeah, it's inevitable. And that really arouses faith in me, like really go, always going back to the, uh, to the teachings of the Buddha, um, really going back to, yeah, the trust also in the elders, like in the elders, the really accomplished, the ones that I really look up to, like the monastics um, that, yeah, are impressive through body, speech and mind and seeing how it's possible. Also reflecting actually on the uh, like terrible stories of when they were, you know, junior monks really helps me. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> like knowing that Bhante Gunaratana, for example, was an um, uh, intolerable monastic when he you know, was uh, a junior monk that nobody wanted to live with him. And now he's like this incredible being full of metta. Just uh, like you know, just now, you know, just thinking about it makes me, yeah, full of joy, full of, uh, full of faith, uh, full of like, yeah, I can do it too, even though I'm like this big grumble of mess, you know. Um, or, um, yeah, uh, Venerable Robina Cortino. So, you know, she has all the different um, stories that from her previous life within this life, uh, that where she was, uh, yeah, significantly less enlightened than she is these days. <laughs> um, so you can see the, the progress that practitioners um, make and you can see the level of incredible wisdom that she has now as opposed to, um, you know, the one that um, she came to while she was very smart, of course, and very, you know, critical thinker, but definitely wasn't as wise as she is uh, these days. So, so yeah, all of these, um, these beings um, are here. That's why it's important actually getting back to the beginning of the five benefits of being endowed with faith you know one of the things that actually i'm the most grateful for is to have um served as a lay person um for this organization for many years before putting the ropes on um because in order to be able to um receive you need to learn how to give uh it's very very important and by having given um actually so much now i I'm reaping so many incredible benefits um, of being surrounded by so many incredible Kalyanamitas and not only myself, but also like others, you know? So it's always whatever we do for ourselves, we do for others, whatever we do for others, we do for ourselves. So you see also this, you know, you're like, oh, this is, you read the sutta and you're like, this is exactly my experience. How incredible is that, you know? Uh, when I met Taya Suchita, I was actually talking about with uh, the venerable here, you know, she's a senior bikuni and, and I was constantly up attacking her. Nobody had told me like, I have to <laughs> like, uh, you know, serve her or look after her, but it just came naturally. And then she accepted my invitation here. Had I not, you know, had that uh, momentum, she would have probably been she would have probably had better things to do, you know, than coming <laughs> onto empty clouds. So it's always like that with every single um, practitioner that um, that we meet. And then when we start seeing these things in our practice, like that we're actually following the teachings of the Buddha and we're actually getting the results that the Buddha says that we're getting, we kind of go, okay, well, right now, you know, maybe... Um, maybe my mind is not as mindful as it even was like... Uh, you know, a month ago, like I'm declining in mindfulness, maybe, but you're like, okay, well, I can actually go improve with my mindfulness or, you know, you, there's always, <laughs> whenever you're backsliding, you also know how to go up and also make that permanent. So you have faith that you can do it just by, by practicing. So I hope this made, makes sense, my Italian English. <laughs> can I also say yes, sure. So, um, like, adding on to that, so I also feel like, um, well, like, to 
the answer to help answer Dan's question also. Um, like this journey has just like we've come from a very long journey of this is our journey. So there's like so many things that we like so many bad things that we've done also. So now that like this like we're going to Buddhism now, like trying to learn, there's like this is it's such like the precious thing. So it's like it's not gonna be um like the bad things always like we kind of have to pay off our debt. <laughs> our so, karmic obstructions. Yeah. <laughs> so um, for me personally, I guess like, you know, um there's like struggles, this and that. So like that's what I would think of. Um I guess, like, you know, just being aware that it's just probably, like, you know, like, when with the struggles, when there's been times that it wasn't easy for the book to also. Yeah. Or, um, the process was long and things like that. So having, so um, being aware of that um, and remembering that constantly is also good, I think, because then it'll give, help you give uh, more faith into um, the book that teaches and, and yeah yeah so karma definitely it's a very important teaching if one takes it um well with wisdom then can be very useful in in the path there's a few things that have um showed up but did you want to take it well first off uh for doshi you asked a question about the use of the words buddhism and buddhist i think that's better for tomorrow evening's monk chat not really related to the topic of faith. Patricia asks, could faith be a type of knowing reverberating from past lives? Sometimes, yeah, sometimes. If somebody's been practicing Buddhism for many lifetimes, then on encountering the Buddhist teachings, they might have a deep, immediate resonance uh, with the Dhamma, uh, sort of a, a instant faith. So a deep confidence that that the Dhamma is is valuable and true. Uh, this is actually quite a common experience. Uh, I know many, many people who this was their experience when they first encountered the Dhamma. There was a deep sense of familiarity and rightness to the Dhamma. Uh, so uh, the only real explanation is that that's coming from past lives. Um, technically a comment not a question but if you want to say something about it go okay, ahead i wanted to read it when one develops an understanding of the name nine qualities of the buddha we develop sadha but it is not a faith built or based on belief this is just one example would you like to comment actually i would like to hear your thoughts on, on that Dante. yeah i mean uh, again i feel like it's it's kind of getting lost in um arguments about the meaning of words uh, terminology so whether you call it faith or belief or conviction or confidence it's or trust it's kind of all beside the point in my mind mm -hmm. um, because all of these are words which are pointing at a similar experience which is yeah you can call it confidence in the dhamma you can call it conviction that the dhamma is true you can call it faith in the dhamma or you can call it trust in the dhamma i mean that's all fine and in my mind, all these words are, are just different ways of talking about what sadda is. Uh, and yeah, contemplating the nature of, of a Buddha can be one way of, of deepening one sadda. Um, but that also tends to work if you already have a fair amount of sadda. Uh, if you go and you list the nine qualities of the Buddha to an atheist, well, they'll, they'll just be like, well, okay, that's a cute set of religious ideas, <laughs> but it's not going to produce any sadda in them. Mm. But if you already have sadda, then contemplating the qualities of the Buddha might make it stronger. Uh, so that, that I would say is something which is relevant to somebody who already has uh, sadda, but maybe not so much for someone who's at the beginning of a practice. Yeah, it is though worth, I guess, highlighting um, in this context, obviously, that the Dhamma invites us to come and see for ourselves. So I think that's when um the sadda becomes something 3d you know like we have faith in something that we are experiencing that we're seeing um that we're trusting i like the word trust actually it really like makes yeah i trust this you know um trust the truth and pia says i just searched found the term amulika sadda in the chanki sutta mm. 
Yeah, actually the Chanky Sutta is a classic sutta on the nature of faith. Um, so uh, yeah, one of these days we should go through the Chanky Sutta again. I haven't gone through it in a while. Um, I've given talks on it in the past, so they might be on our YouTube channel from years ago. It's possible. Put it on the list, but we'll yeah. probably have to wait till the spring because we yeah. have a few other. We'll see. Anyway, thanks for pulling up that reference. That's good to to have pointed out. All right. Okay, and I think we're at the end of it. Yeah. And um, oh, Mary says. Faith is like a box of chocolates. You never know which one you will get, but just know the box of chocolate is a great gift. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Mary is our lovely neighbor. <laughs> okay. Great. great. And I think that's all for this evening. So thank you so much for joining us, joining in. So tomorrow uh, we'll be meeting again at um, 8 a.m. New York City time. And... Uh, Again, 7.30 p.m. New York City time for Monk Chat with our special guest, <laughs> mystery guest. <laughs> and um, who is this incredible bikuni? Well, you will only know by tuning in <laughs> tomorrow at 7.30 p.m. New York City time on the Buddhist Insights YouTube channel. Um, but next week also we'll have a special uh, monk chat with um, the bikunis from Karuna Vihara. Mm. Uh, yeah, so Aya Santusika and Aya Chittananda will be here. So you'll see different faces, same robes, but different faces. <laughs> and possibly like warmer climate um, <laughs> who will be tuning in and um, answering all your questions. Uh, so we can end with three sadhus. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Chanaki is very well informed. She says, I know who she is. <laughs> all right, see you all tomorrow then.